Hi, uh, my name is Angela May Banbury and I'm a senior lecturer in housing and neighbourhoods at Sheffield Ham University. I'm based in the Department of the Natural and Built Environment. During the course of this lecture, I want to explain um, a little bit about the housing and planning system. Um, the planning system plays a critical role in the provision of housing. And I want to spend some time just um, examining that with a particular focus on owner occupied housing, housing that's owned by people either outright or on a mortgage. I'm going to begin by providing an overview of housing and the concept of home. Then I will move on to this notion of housing tenure, the different housing types that people live in and what they mean, and um, focusing on the UK, and then moving to look specifically at the role of the planning system in the promotion and the development of different forms of housing, and then end with some concluding reflections. The term home itself is something which has been um, embedded in our language for a very, very long time. It's um, derived from the Indo-European word um, K, meaning somewhere to lay one's, um, lay one's head. Um, so, you know, the very fact that we think of housing as a fundamental place of, of shelter and that that term has endured um, over the years, I think is quite telling in its own right. Our very language is punctuated with multiple references to home. I flagged a few of these um, sayings here. An Englishman's home is his castle. Home is where the heart is. Wherever I lay my hat, that's my home. The strength of a home derives from the integrity. The strength of a nation derives from the integrity of the home. So said the Chinese philosopher Confucius. Um, a home is a machine for living. That quotation is attributed to the Swiss French architect Luc Corbusier, whose designs in Marseille inspired Park Hill flats. So since time immemorial, people have had to find a place to live. But the real challenge for government and for planning authorities and consequently planning and regeneration professionals is how the properties that we need are delivered and planned for and to what extent they meet the needs of current and future generations. I want to just have a little um, reflective moment um, to invite you to think of what comes to mind when you yourself think of the word home. Sometimes when we abstract things and we talk in policy terms, it's sometimes quite easy to forget that what we're really talking about, and certainly in relation to um, planning policy, is the provision of not just affordable properties, but affordable homes. So have a little think about Firstly, what key terms come to your mind when you think of the word home, different places where you've lived that you would characterize as being home. And secondly, just have a think um, about whether home itself has changed since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Has your relationship with, with home changed? And if so, how has that changed? So we'll pause for... Um, about a minute or two just for you to make some um, preliminary um, notes on those two themes. Okay, so I hope what we've begun to think about is making that connection between the abstract nature of systems, in this case, the planning system, and the extent to which these systems are fundamentally important because of the profound impact they have on um, human lives. Um, Maslow writing around about just before the Second World War, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and whilst this typology has been in existence for some 60 years, I think it still gives us a really um, compact way to begin to think about our own hierarchy of needs and the way that they change over, over time. Um, at the very bottom of the, of the hierarchy 
our physiological needs, food, warmth, rest and shelter, the basic roof over one's head. And moving up the hierarchy, Maslow talks about safety and security. If we live in a home where we can exclude people, where we conceive as a sanctuary, where we can protect ourselves, then that gives us that notion of safety and security. And moving up the pyramid, Maslow talks about um, feeling belonging, a sense of identity, a sense of attachment, um, somewhere where we can have friends and family, um, somewhere that fulfills the need to have intimacy with other people and to form enduring relationships. And those, um, those activities help to fulfill psychological needs. And then as we move further up to the apex of the pyramid, Maslow talks about esteem needs, a feeling of prestige, accomplishment, being able to attain things in life, have a quality of life to the very top, which is this notion of self-actualization, where we feel as though we've achieved our full potential, or at least are working towards that, or at the very minimum have an environment in which that may well happen. So you can see, I hope, the importance of having somewhere to live across all of those points of the pyramid. And of course, conversely, if someone doesn't have those things, how very, very difficult it is to move beyond the very bottom rung of the pyramid, which is just having access to basic warmth and shelter and so on. There are many people for whom home, rather than representing a place of sanctuary, can be a place of fear, particularly for people, for example, who are experiencing um, domestic violence. Our culture is full of representations of home. And in geography, we make the distinction between house as space, very spatial, quantified, and home as place, something which is qualified and rather more subjective. Um, of course, the two concepts are very, very uh, intimately linked, um, but we can see how casually they are um, made available to us across common, common culture. I want to just flag some definitions of home and um, drawing on some key writers. Peter Somerville's definition, as you can see here, um, defines home as a physically, psychologically, and socially constructed in both real and ideal forms. And for Führer and Kaiser, an extension of the self, somewhere which is our, in which our sense of identity is invested. By contrast, Benjamin's characterization of a home is a bit more spatial-like insofar as it's, it's described as a spatially localized, temporarily defined physical frame and conceptual system for ordering, transformation and interpretation of the physical abstract aspects of daily domestic life. So that's quite a dense definition. But essentially what Benjamin's saying is that a home enables us to make that connection between inside the domestic realm, spatially, but to connect outside as well. Um, so home links very much with our environment, both our immediate environment in terms of the way that life plays itself out under, um, under our um, roof, but also in terms of what we engage with outside of um, um, the home itself. According to Lindsay McCarthy, um, home may be characterized as not simply a physical space, place where sleeping, eating and domestic labor occurs, but a complex space of emotion, an anchor for senses of nostalgia and comfort, a field for playing out social relations and a site for performing selfhood. So there's lots of ways that we can think of home in a range of different sorts of, um, different sorts of uh, typologies. So one thing that is clear is that the planning system has some very key challenges to make when it comes to trying to meet the quite hefty demands of the provision of affordable homes. So let's have a little look at the housing types that we have in um, the UK today. So around two thirds of people are owner occupiers, either they own a home or they have a property on a mortgage. 18% rent privately from a, a private sector landlord. 17% um, are social renters, and then there's 1% in 
Bois in this kind of other category of shared ownership and other housing um, tenure types. The word tenure comes from the French verb tenir, to grasp, to hold. So whatever housing tenure you have really determines the extent to which you can access accommodation um, permanently. I should maybe point out that the position that we see as regards housing tenure types today is very, very different to how it was even uh, you know, as early as, well, 100 years ago, when in fact private rents were the dominant form of tenure. That was really because um, the welfare state hadn't formed at that point, and the welfare state was really beginning to, um, well, first began to provide housing um, after the First World War um, period had ended. Um, but then when deregulization of mortgage finance began to grip, and when um, private rented accommodation was deregulated in 1989, then that's when we began to see a real sea change and there was a corresponding decrease in the support for social housing. So these figures in their own right tell us a really interesting story about the landscape of housing today. Well, the role of the planning system is really fascinating because um, the role of the planning system in relation to housing is often to try and enable local communities and local authorities to determine what properties are needed at the local level. Um, so to make that happen, this involves a certain delegation, devolution of powers and financial support to local authorities for decision-making um, purposes. Of course, there are national policy frameworks that govern all of these decisions. Um, a key concern to planning authorities is um, sustainable house building, sustainable design, um, making neighborhoods sustainable, and not just, in, not, envir not just environmentally sustainable, but socially sustainable. And to do that, planning authorities have a key role to play in terms of civic engagement of the community within the planning system. There are some alternate models, and if anyone's interested in this, I would really advise you to do look this up. Um, things like community land trusts, which sit outside the planning system um, a little bit, but make fascinating um, examples to explore in their, in their own right. There is this mythology which prevails in, um, in the British planning system that we should all aspire to be part of what's called a property owning democracy, um, which is a bit of an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms in the sense that um, is that really is that really possible? Is it possible to have 100% of people owning property democratically within the housing system today? And what we'll always find is that there will be people, there are winners and losers within the housing system who will be squeezed out of the market and for whom um, the welfare state provides a safety net, um, a helping hand to enable people to um, to begin to rebuild their lives after say a period of homelessness or unemployment or, or, or sickness, when perhaps maybe people did own their own homes but had them repossessed. But there's also a more urgent problem in some ways, which is enabling everyone to be able to get a foot on the housing um, ladder. And that's easier said than done. Um, and here we get into some really interesting um, discussions and um, explorations of what makes affordable housing. The definition of affordable housing is um, elusive and there are several of them, but generally a consensus exists that if we spend more than a third of our disposable income on housing, then we're getting ourselves into a position of our accommodation being unaffordable. Um, so, you know, there is this notion that, you know, everyone agrees that we need to build but there's much less of a consensus as to where building takes place, um, not just to protect uh, existing um, um, greenbelt areas, but also to make sure that urban density um, doesn't become uh, unsustainable. Um, it's really interesting to think of, you know, planning and how the, the planning system has changed and altered over the years. And certainly it's been beholding to ebbs and flows of central government. 
there were some new proposals announced in September that um, said that now um, the, plan the planning system would focus itself on new homes, hospitals, schools and shops, and that those proposals for those developments would be automatically allowed. And this basically means that local scrutiny will be sidestepped. This is quite a radical shakeup for the planning um, profession overall. Um, there are still provisions in place to protect Greenbelt areas, but it's worth keeping an eye out on, on that. And particularly as we enter into the, um, you know, COVID, um, uh, the sort of post COVID, hopefully, era when the economy will need major restructuring and society itself has taken several hits uh, across a range of areas. Um, so we look to the planning system to try and facilitate a sufficient flow of properties within government guidelines and a response to local community needs and um, to, to try and achieve housing, housing targets. So let's have a little look at owner occupation itself. It's said that we need something like 3 million new social homes over the next 20 years to solve the housing crisis. Another estimate um, is a quarter of a million new homes every year. And we're really so far behind that target. Um, really, we're lagging very, very far behind. So we're in a position where the housing crisis has become most acute. I was involved in some research last July with Sheffield City Council that was looking at young people's views of their housing futures. And this was to mark 100 years of council um, housing in Sheffield, a part of a research study that I was involved with at that time. And I led an online survey based on um, the findings of 100 people between the ages of 18 to 25. And the results of that uh, research, I think, were truly fascinating because there was certainly a clear sense of whilst everyone wanted to own their own home, you know, obviously we recognize the capital and the cultural assets that can be gained from being a homeowner. The extent to which that as a goal seemed very remote for um, the vast majority of people who took part in, in that survey. A total of 85% considered home ownership as either not at all, not at all, viable um, because cost was uh, prohibitively high. Um, and it's noteworthy that actually uh, owner occupation amongst people in the 16 to 34 age group has dropped from 54 to 34 percent from 1996 to 2016. So we see that that going in, into decline, numbers of people, um, younger people who can access home ownership. England and the UK, in fact, is one of the highest levels of home ownership in Europe. Other countries which come quite close are Spain and Ireland. But interestingly, home ownership in um, the UK has always been linked to the right to vote. You couldn't vote um, unless you were a landowner until the Great Reform Acts of 1830, 1840, and there was a series of them began to put that in justice right. But there's always been this inextricable link between voting patterns and people's housing tenure. And we see that um, kind of beginning to, um, we see pictures of that across the country linked to housing tenure type, whether people rent or whether they own their own homes or whether they're social renters. <clears throat> I mentioned the impact of COVID just there um, a moment ago. I think we need to be braced for a very uncertain future at precisely the time when we need to have assurances and anchors of certainty. We see levels of unemployment rising substantially. We see levels of street homelessness increasing. We see the fact that the government has put a temporary moratorium on evictions from private rents, but we don't know how long that will last for. We don't know what will happen when the furloughing scheme um, is withdrawn, which currently at the time of recording this, and um, which is the 30th of September, was due to end in October. So we're getting very close to having quite a catastrophic breakdown, economic breakdown with substantial economic and social restructuring to take place in the years ahead. We're at a critical juncture in history. 
you perhaps maybe have experienced the house purchasing process, but just thought I would um, just summarize this as we're going along. Um, you, in theory, this is how it goes. Um, you identify somewhere, you arrange to see it, you put in an offer, you apply for a mortgage, you probably, or you most likely will not get all of the mortgage, so you'll need to find a deposit. You arrange survey, exchange contracts, complete, move in. Now that's a very simplistic way to um, express what's really often quite an emotional and quite fraught process that demands um, quite a, a big investment, not just in terms of deposits, but in terms of surveyors fees and solicitor conveyancing fees and so on. So just to have a little look at how much this does actually cost. Um, often we're talking um, even before the house um, is sold well over a thousand pounds for surveys. Then we've got the deposit to pay. And then we've got our, our monthly mortgage payments. And of course they're, 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 they have interest on top of those as well. So the true cost um, of an 80,000 pound mortgage could be you know, it would vary depending on the Bank of England base rate and your mortgage for 120,000. Um, so, you know, properties are a major investment, but there's something that we need as a society for um, cohesion, for stability, and to enable people to, um, to achieve their life goals. So just finally, just some concluding reflections. So we've had a very brief glimpse at some of the sort of planning policies and practices that are um, relevant um, in terms of the planning profession and housing today. We've noted, albeit briefly, but that planning itself changes in response to shifting government ideologies. And especially since the 1970s, when there was a move from top down and uh, quite paternalistic approaches to planning to more bottom up that sought to engage um, citizens at the civic and democratic level. We are under huge pressure to build more housing stock and there's still a substantial deficit in the investment for social housing. But the real challenge is where will people live, both current and future generations? Everyone has to live somewhere, but currently we're falling well short of our targets that we need to create um, a nation which is adequately and affordably housed. The other thing finally, just to end on, is that the planning profession has huge challenges ahead, not just in terms of the promotion or the um, um, ability to facilitate the um, properties that we need through the development con control system, but also to mitigate any environmental or um, other damage that may be, um, may be done as a process, a consequence. So balancing the need to build alongside the need to build sustainably, economically, environmentally and socially, I think is a real challenge for the future. So that's just a very brief overview of the importance of housing to the planning system. Um, do get in touch if you have any immediate queries on this. And meanwhile, I look forward to seeing you in the seminar for this session. So thanks very much and bye for now.